are live. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another evening presentation here on the Tattooed Historian page. I'm so happy to have my friend back for the fourth time, four time champ here on this. Stephanie Seal Walters is in the house. Stephanie, how are you, dear? I'm doing good, hon. And how are you doing? <laughs> I'm hanging in there. I'm I'm living the dream. I am just being uh, isolated and creating content, which is what I love to do. Yeah, the quarantine dream. Yes, yes. And I hope everyone's well in your household. Yeah, everyone's doing good here. Um, um, my husband is considered an essential, essential employee. So it's you, me and my daughter and my teleworking and my dissertation. So you can imagine how well that's going over here. <laughs> so, how, how close are we being done with the dissertation? We are scheduling a defense day. I just sent a round of edits to my advisor. So it's getting closer and closer and closer. Although, you know, there's so many bigger things going on in the world right now, but the thought of doing like a Zoom defense actually kind of breaks my heart just a little bit, um, just because it's been <laughs> six to seven years in the making. But at the same time, you know, we all do what we got to do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, God bless you for that. Uh, Stephanie, even though you've been on three other times, let's let everyone know about uh, you and your and your biography as far as what you're working on now. You're at Southern Mississippi right now. I am. I'm at Southern Mississippi. So I am currently a PhD candidate at George Mason University. Um, I am a revolutionary era historian. I study loyalists and loyalism in Williamsburg, Virginia. Um, Williamsburg, Virginia. That was my master's thesis. <laughs> Y'all, it's crazy here. Um, in Virginia um, during the Revolutionary War. So basically the guys who did not want to um, declare independence from Great Britain. It's been mm -hmm. a fascinating story. Um, but right now I am the digital liaison in the humanities at the University of Southern Mississippi. So yeah, awesome. back home in Mississippi. Woo! There you go. It's a little bit warmer than we are here in Pennsylvania. Yeah, um, this is because my husband um, likes to freeze me out of my own house, but it's probably 80 degrees outside right now. <laughs> and I'll be heading off soon to the area of the world where a lot of those loyalists went off to. Yes. Know, Canada. Oh, Canada. Yeah, you're going to have to come visit. And, yeah. Uh, oh, and Facebook, if you hear screams in the background, that's no one being tortured. That's just my two-year-old defying <laughs> her father. <laughs> yes, she, she might make an appearance without us realizing it. I don't know. Yeah, she's going to hear Uncle John and try to run into the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she hasn't seen me in a while, so that'd be good. Yeah. Um, but tonight we have a really cool topic. I, I, I'm i glad you chose something really different because a lot of people have been seeing a lot of Civil War history on my page. And mm -hmm. I was like, we need to talk about something other than the Civil War for an evening. And you chose uh, pop history and its effects on storytelling. I did. Deep. Well, one reason, because I have been on many platforms of the tattooed historian at this point, and every time I'm talking about loyalism. Um, so I figured as much as I love loyalism, loyalism is the best historical topic ever. And I will, they can put that on my tombstone. Um, but at the same time, we're all in quarantine right now. Um, a lot of what people are being exposed to at home, since we're all Netflixing like crazy and um, catching up on our showtime. And if we're reading, um, is a lot of popular history. So things that um, are usually entertainment based, um, they're meant for mass media consumption, which means the everyday person can go pick up a book off of Barnes and Noble shelf. Um, I think we talked about before the difference between popular history and academic history. So more of like what we do. Um, academic history is more argument based. Um, even if you're doing a case study of say like a regiment during the civil war or the revolution or Vietnam, um, even if you're looking at a particular Particular regiment or a company, you're usually like you're bringing it back to X, Y, and Z arguments like how is it reflective of the time period? How is it a reflective of warfare? Um, whereas popular history has a little bit more entertainment value than just that. Um, biographies, you know, help me out, John. Come on, throw something out at me. Outlander. Uh, yeah, Outlander. Yeah, there you go. Outlander. Yeah. Yeah. We got well. We 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 have to cover John Adams too while we're at it tonight. Well, duh. Yeah. <laughs> Worm of popular history that there ever was. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I was actually uh, trying to think of some things today that was currently on Netflix here in the states to try to get people to understand what we were talking about. And there's just a ton of stuff on Netflix, Amazon Prime, and all that 
that uh, so many people can watch now that's popular history, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, it's just amazing. The only thing that I uh, really can't stand is that Amazon Prime took Wolf Hall off and I loved Wolf Hall. Why and that was like my favorite thing. That was uh, Henry VIII uh, with uh, Damien Shields as Henry VIII. And uh, I loved it. And I was like, oh, this is going to get me into this time period. And then they did that. They ripped it off of there. And I'm like, oh, OK. Yeah. But it was one of those things where I didn't. It got me interested in a subject I was never interested in before. And I think that's a really cool facet of popular history is it can really just grab you and be like, wow, you never thought of this, did you? Exactly. And I think that's kind of the, I think, and we've talked about this before. I think when I was on your podcast last time, we talked about how, at least for me, popular history is what made me want to be a historian before I knew exactly what historians did um, with the argumentative research, you know, background. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I was insanely into Egyptian history because that was the time period of Brendan Fraser and the mummy and, you know, the Scorpion King and all like, oh my gosh, I thought it was phenomenal. And so then I decided I wanted to be an archaeologist and I had Egypt stuff all over my house, like a normal child, like one normal child does. Right. Um, and, you know, of course, we've talked beforehand about how John Adams made me want to study the revolution at a time in my life when I wanted nothing to do with American history. So popular history definitely inspires a lot of us. Um, I think in a lot of academic circles, even though Indiana Jones was an archaeologist, um, a lot of people tell you, when did you know you wanted to be a historian? It'll be like, Indiana Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Chasing Nazis. Yeah. And that that comes up a lot where people are like, oh, I saw this movie, I got interested in it, and now I have to, you know, do an impression of it or build something around there or, because I've, I've, through the interpretive world, and, you know, it's one of those things where people are like, where'd you come up with this idea? Oh, I saw a documentary of mm -hmm. this, piqued my interest, and now I want to um, create something out of that that's three-dimensional instead of watching it on TV. It's yeah. really interesting how popular history can affect us in our day-to-day -day lives and sometimes make us spend more money on historical impressions we never thought we were going to do in our exactly, lives. Exactly, right? And mm -hmm. I mean, I know at least in my dissertation, I do consider, I consider myself an academic historian. Um, I mean, because I am an academic historian, not just because I consider myself one. Um, but, you know, popular history has actually had an effect on my research and my dissertation. I know one of the things when we were promoing this talk tonight, um, we were talking about Outlander just because season five is on, um, it's on Showtime, Stars. I don't even know because I always get it second afterwards. Um, but yeah. anyway, it's premiering right now. And um, there's actually, when I started watching Outlander, I was in the middle of writing my dissertation and realized, huh, maybe I should pay a little bit more attention to the Scots in my dissertation. And sure enough, boom, um, like I'll have a whole chapter on them now. So they can even influence us who, you know, are in the middle of writing academic works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know, I'm, I know that we have this in common that uh, John Adams really changed our outlook on some parts of history. And, and we talked about this in the first live stream we did. We talked about this in the podcast we did. We talked about this at the live event we did together. Um, but it was one of those moments where HBO was really big on those kinds of things. And they still are to an extent, mm -hmm. but, but it all stemmed from like when they, they did Band of Brothers once, and then they did P the Pacific, they did John Adams. And that really started to showcase these 10 part series of someone or some unit or a group of people, uh, that really showcase something different for a lot of people to see. And you can see book sales start to just climb for the longest time because they're like wow okay people are interested in the second world war now or they're interested in john adams and and i and i really think that uh now it's now it's hamilton you know and, yeah. and it has been for a couple of years but yeah but yeah and, so, and that i think that's really important to talk about too right is the what we see on the uh on the stage as popular history yeah Exactly. Um, Hamilton. Oh, man. As much as he, um, Lynn, is it Lynn manuel Miranda? Look yes. at me. I'm 
terrible. Yeah, I always get the last two mixed up. Um, he is adorable and he is a saint and he is an amazing person. And I think like, oh my gosh, every time I watch the Today Show and he pops up and he comes up, I'm always thrilled to death because he's just precious. Mm. I can't stand Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> and not because I think the show is phenomenal I think the premise behind the show is phenomenal the songs are great I'm just such a team John Adams person I can't stand to be around the topic of Alexander Hamilton <laughs> for that long um so I'm like oh, god and he does a really good job of showing the dark shady side of Hamilton um but yeah John Adams the miniseries actually ruined my experience with Hamilton the musical because now I'm team John Adams and Alexander Hamilton. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that amazing how it can it can make you choose sides without you even you know realizing it? You're like, oh well, he was against Adams or whomever at this oh, time. So, Adams. Yeah, yeah, so I so I can't be on that team. I'm Team Adams. I'm Team John Adams, and even though John Adams was arguably one of the worst presidents in the United States, yeah. I'm still Team John Adams. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 I, I spend so much time watching um, TV shows and thinking about TV shows that are either historically based or have influenced cultural uh, outlooks on things like that. And uh, like I brought up Wolf Hall earlier and everything, but God shows like uh, MASH, you know, was, oh, was a huge hit and brought people into, a lot of people thought it was the second world war for the longest time. And they're like, oh, this is the Korean war or, or uh, Downton Abbey you know mm -hmm. and it's just like these blockbuster things that are making people think otherwise there was even you can touch on this there was even tours built around like downton abbey or these other places because now it's the behind the scenes at mansions yeah i know um i know they have the downton abbey tours i know another historical based drama um called the midwife which is one of my favorite historical based dramas ever um they usually sell out of their tours like i think one time i was looking at going to london and this was like a year out and i was like oh well while i'm there i want to do the call the midwife tour and you couldn't get tickets for it because it's that popular um and i know the same goes for outlander um i think there was an article I saw a few months ago how Outlander has made tourism in Scotland just explode like people wanting to go to the Culloden battlefield um go and see the different places that are shown in the show so popular history cannot just be good for you know inspiring folks it can also be like help public history sites it can help tourism in a specific area so it's usually has a decent influence I know sometimes there's drawbacks to that uh, but it can have a good influence sometimes what about uh, you've you've done work in the classroom, obviously, through your graduate studies and everything like that. Mm -hmm. What about have you seen subtle shifts in, in students where they're like, oh, I got to see this the other day and this was, uh, you know, this was pretty a crazy episode of Outlander or this was this. And you start to see that kind of coming into the classroom via social or via cultural stuff. Yeah. A lot. Um, students usually when I'm in a classroom setting will, and I've taught four times, I've taught four classes, um, they will always come in and talk about some of their favorite shows. Even when I was the TA, they would be like, oh man, I love World War II because of this documentary I saw. My favorite ever was, and this is how long I've been in the field, because this was like, God, when did Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter come? Oh my. That was a long time ago. I was, a, I think I was a TA when that came out and I had students who were obsessed with it. Um, <laughs> and I, when it comes to popular history, like especially historical fiction, if you're going to go into fiction and history, I mean, God, just go for it. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, woo, it went for it. Um, <laughs> one of them that was actually really popular when I was in um, classes, I was in an oral history class one time and a book I was assigned was actually World War Z um, because mm -hmm. World War Z, the movie is very different from World War Z, the book. World War Z, the book actually has um, more about an oral historian who's trying to take snippets of um of what happened during the zombie apocalypse and there's actually really good oral historical methods within the book um so that's a way that you know popular history and historical fictions can be because even though i don't know if you'd call that a historical fiction but it's about you know a historian trying to collect these stories so it can be used for good right 
I've, I've, I've heard a lot of blowback from others in the field, whether it be from the public history field or academia, where they despise uh, historical fiction with movies. And they're like, well, everything is based off a true story or based on yeah. a true story. And then, uh, you know, we have to fight to not fight, but we have to try to uh, clean up the field as it sort of speak to, uh, you know, tell people, well, this is partially true, but this isn't and everything else. Do you see do you see those kind of things as a hindrance or do you see them as a positive in in the field as far as I, I'm sure it's different for like Abraham Lincoln vampire hunter. Yeah, because that. obviously they know that's fiction. One hundred right. Yeah, that. obviously it's fiction. Um yeah. I see it as both and I'll say why. And because we can't talk about, so there goes an email. Um, we can't talk about historical fiction and popular history without discussing the Patriot. Um, that's kind of like the catalyst for all discussion. This is the elephant in the room. Oh God, is it the elephant in the room? Because when the Patriot came out, gosh, was that like the nineties, the late nineties? Oh, it was 2000, yeah. I think. Was it 2000? I, think. Um, I was a kid. I know that I was a kid and that movie, we bought the DVD as soon as that movie came out and it ran in my house a million times because if you don't know the era that well, the movie's phenomenal. I'm sorry. It's Mel Gibson before we really knew he was crazy. Right. And um, it's a great story. Heath Ledger's hot. I mean, everything's great. Um, but I will say as someone who studies the revolutionary war and now that I kind of know better, the Patriot drives me insane. And it's because it comes up in my talks all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes mm -hmm. that's not necessarily a bad thing. I will always have the little old man in the front row at um, some of my talks who always says, when I talk about loyalists, will they burn those poor people <laughs> in a church? And yeah, right, they burn those poor people in a church. And I'm like, oh man, no. No one burned anyone in a church during the Revolutionary War. Mel Gibson just really hated the British. It did happen in World War II. Um, but no, at no point in the Revolutionary War anywhere in the 13 colonies was anyone burned in a church. But as much as that drives me crazy, it's also a phenomenal question and an opener to actually talk about what loyalists and what Bannister Tarleton actually did during the revolution, which mm -hmm. burning people in a church, I don't know how you could get much worse than that, but if you could, Bannister Tarleton could. Mm -hmm. And I actually don't understand why um, he's known as Colonel Tavington in the movie, but we all know he's Bannister Tarleton. And there's so many different episodes of the Revolutionary War that Tarleton just does the most horrible outlandish stuff by like dragging dead bodies behind horses. I mean, like there's all sorts of stuff that they could have gone with that was historically accurate and just as horrible. Um, so when people do ask questions based on popular history like that, it makes me go, oh God, more people think Tarleton burned people in a church. Yeah. And then also leads me into a deeper greater conversation about actual events that happen so mm -hmm. that makes sense it does and i'm on it brings me back to a point that i thought of where that scene in that movie probably brought some people to your talk when you were talking about loyalists because they're like oh i gotta point out that they burned these people in this church oh my gosh like the fact that loyalists have been vilified consistently in American media since the Revolutionary War. Um, because seriously, they pop up in novels in the 19th century as just being the ultimate villain, um, bicentennial. There's a lot of fictional books based about loyalists that once again makes them this villain. Um, Bannister Tarleton. And it's not Tarleton that burns down the church. Remember, it's like the chump loyalist that I never remember his name. He hands yeah. me to it. It's the loyalist that burns down the church. Um right. Like, so yeah, so once again, it's also great for me because it brings people to my talks and they want to talk about it because it's controversial and it gives me a platform to kind of correct these, you know, villainous, you know, characters we've seen. Mm -hmm. But I actually have a follow-up question for you okay. about that. Because since I know you don't reenact the Revolutionary War, but a lot of our friends who are probably watching right now, mm -hmm. um, a lot of our friends are in the historical interpretation community and the reenacting community. 
And I know a lot of times when it comes to popular histories, um, documentaries where they show like little bits and pieces of people fighting or whatnot, um, in movies, a lot of the big complaints come from material culture historians. Do you want to kind of talk a little bit about that? Like, you know, clothing and stuff? Oh, yeah. Uh, I know that I have friends who refuse to watch historical movies with me because they're like, no, he's just going to pick apart a little thing that's driving him crazy. But I, it's really hard for me to watch a movie that's historically based and not click into that interpreter side of me. And I have to keep telling myself that it's entertainment. Um, and the one way that I think about it is history and Hollywood only have one thing in common. It's they begin with the same letter. And, yeah. and that's about it. After that, throw the rest out. I um, think we just found your um, 2021 t-shirt. Yeah, yeah right. Slogan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I've always thought that. And, and um, because I know that I'll sit there and I'll pick apart, like, are they, if it's a if it's a war movie and they're using weapons that weren't even involved in the war <laughs> and it's like well, wait a minute they didn't have these um uh yeah it it can get down to the uniforms and equipment and all that stuff but it's stuff that an interpreter would know but not what the general public would know so they yeah. know so so costumers uh for the most part understand that hey um we can get by with this because only 5% of the population is going to know that this jacket had, you know, nine buttons, not four. Uh, yeah. um, but it gets it. You really see the actors and producers who really do a great job with it, which makes me admire certain um, actors and directors more because you can see they're really getting into the weeds and they're really trying hard. Like, I mean, I think, you know, not, not doing the impression myself, but just watching the material culture behind it. I think Master and Commander is one of the best huh. Napoleonic naval movies ever made, but probably the only good naval Master movie Commander. Napoleonic ever made. Um, because it's down to, you know, the epaulette, down to the hat, down to the, and that's why I love it so much that whoever did the material culture got it right. And as far as I have heard, uh, an actor like Russell Crowe is like very into that. He wants it yeah. to be exact. Um, <clears throat> so you almost have to have a historical perfectionist, even though there isn't such a thing yeah. on there trying to say, well, wait a minute, you know, this is what, this is what they carried here. And this is what they carried there. Yeah. And I know a lot of my interpreter friends and I would have like a mystery science 3000 show if we could and just have us watching these things and being like no that's not right no that's not right yeah. but then we have to pull ourselves back we have to be like well wait a minute this movie's going to bring people out to the field to see what we're trying to do mm -hmm. just like you say you can make it a uh, a stepping off point and be like yeah. how many have seen this movie how many saw this scene okay what's right about it and what's wrong about it so it's a conversation starter we just have to make sure it's a conversation starter to the general public and they don't think that it's all real like that old man up front who thinks that they burn you know colonists and churches yeah i even remember so when i defended years ago when i defended my prospectus um you have to do a presentation on what you want your dissertation to be about how you're going to go about it and i the first thing i did before i showed my powerpoint presentation was i showed a clip from 1776 the musical which mm -hmm. is a national treasure yeah. um and i showed the song the lees of old virginia the whole four minute clip where richard henry lee is talking about how wonderful virginia is and how they're basically chosen by god and virginia is the most patriot raw raw virginia because the whole point of my dissertation is proving that like for years um during the time period and in the historiography published after the war um no one's wanted to talk about loyalists because they pretend like they're not there because virginia is supposed to be the perfectly patriotic state during the time period and so this one scene as ex as crazy and as over the top as it was was actually the perfect stepping off point for what i'm trying to prove and for virginia history in general during the revolutionary era so it can definitely be used um to show you know what we're trying to do in the field and how we're trying to correct things 
1776. So you are Team Feeney then. I am Team Feeney. Although, I mean, John Adams, I think, is in heaven right now, thrilled to death that he's had such wonderful actors play him over the years. Yeah. Um, he, yeah, between um, Mr. Feeney um, and Paul Giamatti, mm -hmm. he can't be mad about that. That's pretty no. great. And yeah. Paul Giamatti is always John Adams to me now. Yeah, Eve. As much as I love William Daniels, um, it will. When I think of John Adams, I think of Paul Giamatti. So uh, right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I I tried to think of some movies too that uh, just your major motion pictures, which really uh, you know made people think differently about an era or open the door to new eras and just a couple that were off the top of my head recently we had dunkirk uh, which got people into early second world war stuff um yeah. i thought of you because i thought of oh brother where art thou and that reminds me of like where you probably live yeah a so brother where art thou was actually shot down the road from me um go. no joke in fact so there's a particular scene um where there where George Clooney and everyone, they're walking down the road and there's a farmer who like stares off and like looks at him and he has a bunch of horses. He's actually from Poplarville, this town that I'm from. Really? Um, and those were his horses that were in this, that were in the shot. So, oh brother, where art thou is very much a statewide treasure here in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, we got, uh, the, one of the major blockbusters was uh, 12 Years a Slave, uh, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, and and the one thing that I really saw a lot of interpretation open up, speaking as an interpreter, uh, because I started out in Civil War interpretation, and I saw a lot of people start going to Western because of Tombstone. And I was like, oh, yeah, Tombstone is like the greatest Western ever made. So people wanted to be like that, you know. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Tombstone. My husband. So funny story about that it has nothing to do about history. Um, my husband made me watch Tombstone like right when we got engaged. It's one of my favorite movies of all time now, but it kind of blew up my childhood because I realized that every word out of my father's mouth while growing up was actually a tombstone quote. <laughs> so like the whole time I'm watching the movie, I'm like, my dad's been saying all of this, like I'm in my prom and oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm like, Oh gosh. Yeah. So Tombstone's just a classic. You finally figured out where it came from. I did. Yeah. I realized my whole life was Tombstone movie quotes the whole time and didn't know. And I think I called him up and was like, did, have you ever seen Tombstone? And he just started laughing. <laughs> <laughs> How do you see this uh, popular history history uh, in the classroom as far as do you see classes being taught on it in in different places because I know where I'm off to at, at Western uh, Professor uh, Alan McEachern teaches a class on mm -hmm. uh, history at the movies and, yeah and it's 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 for it's for like kids who aren't going to be history majors it's like oh we'll grab you with history in the movies so yeah one of the best courses I took as an undergrad was it was called history cinema and film um and I sucked at it because it was of course a 20th century class and let me tell you what oh man you might as well just give me advanced calculus when you hand me the 20th century yeah. um so yeah by the time the steam engine is around I just like tip off um so anyway that was one of the best classes ever because we got to learn about particular um themes in American history by what was being produced film wise during the time period so um rebel without a cause being a post-world war ii um generation trying to keep up with the masculinity of their fathers who they believed were coming like effeminate um looking at things like godzilla in the post you know nuclear war age and so many different themes like that and it was really incredibly eye-opening so it wasn't actually looking at historical film themes, you know, films that were based on history per se, right. but it was really interesting to see um, how historical eras are kind of like defined by the movies that are coming out and during the time period. So, mm. so that's what, what's that say about us in like the early 2000s? When we're... Okay. Well, we weren't too far off because we were really obsessed with vampires and zombies. And since we're in the middle of a global pandemic. So <laughs> yeah, we're prepared. I mean, we're fair. You know. Yeah. And it's, like and it's the, it's the era when, uh, you know, I think as far as a military historian is concerned, because it's what basically what I got my bachelor's and master's in, that era was when it really kicked off. And you start to see a lot more students who are studying military history and, and 
because we just had Band of Brothers, Saving Private Ryan, uh, the Pacific. Uh, you go back, what, early, mid 90s, we had the Memphis Bell um, and stuff like that. So you can see whatever field you're studying in the history field, you're like, oh, it, it peaked here because they gave, they had $100 million movies come out at this yeah. time. And that's yeah. a really interesting stat too, when you think about it, that um, you you were impacted by John Adams, which had just come out. And so your, your studying took a different turn as well. And it's- Completely. And I, I mean, we've I've, God bless the poor people who've had to listen to my podcast and that first Facebook Live that we did a year or so ago, because um, I've had to hear this story a bunch of times, but I knew very quickly that I wanted to go to grad school and I wanted to be an academic historian. I actually started out in journalism, um, but history had always been this constant in my life. And when I was a freshman, I changed over to history. And as soon as I did, I jumped head first and okay, I'm gonna be an academic historian. Um, Like it was really crazy how it was like an overnight decision. But I had this mentor at the time who she was a medievalist, one of the best medievalists there are. And I loved her so much. I took every single course that she taught in medieval history and early modern European history. And I was set, man. I was going to study the 12th century Renaissance. I was all about the Empress Matilda. I love the Crusades. (laughs) Like I was sold, sold. Um, And my father was he wasn't mad about it. He was like, why not U.S. history? And I was like, there's no castles. There's no monarch except for the first hundred and something years. Like, (laughs) I was like, no, it's not old enough. Um, It's not crumbling. It's not old. And then he sat me down and he made me watch John Adams. And after the first episode, I was done. Like complete Mm -hmm. trans. Once again, I have, there's a theme in my life of complete transformations. Um, (laughs) And I decided that was it. Like American history won. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I'm I'm watching for anyone watching, I'm looking over here to the side because I'm watching the comments and uh, people are, people are, uh, yeah, you got your comments there. People are doing uh, some great things with talking about uh, projects they've done, uh, classes they've taken, uh, Jonathan Streff just commented, glory impacted my interest in African-American history. Boy, did that ever do that with me too. Oh man. That, and that was exactly. the first Civil War movie I ever saw in my life. I was eight years old and I sat down in front of the television and saw that opening Antietam scene and the guy get decapitated. And I'm like, oh, I got to turn this off real quick. This is just too much, you know. Uh, but I was hooked on history because uh i was told to watch glory if you're into the american civil war and i'm young eight-year-old kid okay i had my my grandparents buy me the movie because i didn't know and that was when it was solidified it's like yep i'm a civil war guy and good great soundtrack too glory you have to have good soundtracks if you're going to have a historical drama last of the mohicans (laughs) oh yeah yeah I, I have my issues with the movie, but the soundtrack is legit, you know. The soundtrack is legit, yeah. Yeah, and and um, I I don't know what how you feel about it, but I also put, um, as far as pop history is concerned, I also put into the category uh, video games, only because mm-hmm. it's how people sometimes get um, introduced to new time periods or things that were used in those time periods because I can't tell you how many times I've been doing a second world war living history and I'll have kids come up and be like, Oh, that's this, 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 that holds this many rounds and all this. And I'm like, what am I even doing here? You guys know it, you know, and I don't know how you yeah. feel about that. Um, oh, 100%. It's actually really funny that you brought up games um, because I am also a digital historian and um, before the whole quarantine stuff went down, we're still teaching it in a class, Um, but we're actually talking about in this digital history class that I'm helping teach Mm -hmm. about video games and their relevance to history and um, why, because one of the number one history games ever isn't nearly as fancy as Assassin's Creed, although I love Assassin's Creed, is organ trail like Mm -hmm. everyone's second and third grade experience of like our generation was sitting around an old windows 95 computer typing your friend's name in and seeing who was going to die of dysentery or whether or not the entire you know wagon was going to collapse in the river and 
that was kind of a lot of children's first exposure to Western United States history. Like what, what is <laughs> like this little, you know, tiny video game, like, and there's a bunch of actual academic articles written about people's exposure to Oregon Trail and it being so, you know, having such an impact on people's childhoods. Um, and also it's kind of, you know, a lot of times people's only exposure to history was Oregon Trail. Yep. Um, also, but like Assassin's Creed, uh, we're one of the big things we're gonna talk about in this course that I'm helping teach is Assassin's Creed um, because of course there's historical dilemmas there but when I was teaching the Crusades one time I had my students I thought I was going to be talking over their head the whole time because so many of them had actually pay, played Assassin's Creed they were keeping up with me and I was like this is phenomenal because I thought I, you know student you don't get the Crusades history in K through 12, 12 you know history courses so me coming at them in a you know undergraduate course Mm -hmm. hung in hung in there so mm -hmm. i appreciated it yeah and, and i've had blowback from uh other historians or older historians who are like you know that's silly you shouldn't be trying to use that and all that and i just look at them sometimes and i'm like it's a multi-billion dollar industry yeah i can't bring that billion dollar industry down i might as well work with them and try to be like you're playing this anyway and i'm playing it so I'm playing these video games as well. Well, why would I not try to utilize them as a teaching tool uh, yeah. in some form? And, and now with universities getting e-gaming teams together, it's like, it's already in yeah. there. Yeah, there's actually, there's, um, there's a, quite a few universities that actually have like majors now in video gaming and historical video gaming. And just because it's so big, um, at the moment, but I mean, look also like the random good that video games also do for, um, our society. So I know, and everybody who's probably watching is like, yes, yeah, Stephanie doesn't play video games. I don't play video games. I listen to people who play video games. Um, but Notre Dame Cathedral burned down that, or, you know, basically burned down. Um, I don't know which Assassin's Creed it was. Someone put it in the comments, but they, the people who were create, developing the game actually used laser technology to get Notre Dame Cathedral. And I think I read an article of like a few months ago that that was actually being used in the possible reconstruction of Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, God bless them. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm there for it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's just, uh, one of those things where it's like i'm hooked on it as far as a game is concerned whatever is going on and i see people making youtube videos off of like armor on a tank in this game and why it's legitimate or why it's silly or whatever else or why it's not authentic and it's like that's a that's a teaching tool that's you know what we're doing and it's so funny to think that um we, we used to be picked on for playing these types of games and doing that because it was a waste of time. And now it's like, well, that's keeping us sane during this time where we're away from everybody else. We need something well, to do. Yeah. And we're playing these games or we're, we're getting on Twitch together or, or whatever it may be. Um, but I think that popular uh, history effect of it is starting to be seen more now because of our shared experience right now. Yeah, exactly. And I know I've talked to you before. I have a colleague at George Mason. She now works at the University of Alabama um, in their library system as a digital historian. She studies video game history and kind of the rise of video games in the late 70s going through the 90s. And Anne McDivitt, if you're watching this right now, comment so John can talk to you. But she yes. would be phenomenal if there is an interest in the feed if you're interested in video game history um definitely write that in the feed so john knows to possibly reach out to ann yeah. um but it's definitely a field that's popping up in history at the moment that's phenomenal yeah and, and i would love to speak with her yeah um jared frederick is on here a friend of mine hey, and great great author uh, is there any historical film you would tell people not to watch or can every movie be a foundation or discussion or in short, what historical movie other than the Patriot do you really dislike and why? Oh God. That's, that's a great a, question. That's a wonderful question. Can you tell he teaches at the collegiate level? Uh, yeah. <laughs> a little bit. God, I hope I'm not embarrassing you fellow academic historian. <laughs> um, what? 
there's so many bad ones and I'm trying to just think off of the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Um, I think my biggest issue with the Patriot is it was trying to come off as a historical film, not just entertainment, but they, I felt like when it was the promo for it, when it came out in the nineties or early two thousands, whenever that was, um, is that it was trying to be pushed off as a more historically based film and not as historical fiction. Of course, you know, Tabington versus Charlton. And that's kind of what upset me the most about it that I honestly believe as bad of a historical film as any film can be. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a great foundation for a discussion. Um, File the Theta, which is a history honor society. When I was um, one of the members of that at Southern Miss when I was an undergrad, we actually had a movie night where we would watch a historically based film and then we would rip it to shreds um, and talk about the inaccuracies, but it would also lead to discussions about, you know, what was the correct history? Why do you think the director or the writer decided to go this path? And and it was always a an incredible teaching tool. Um, so, because I'm, I'm actually trying to think of what an even worse historical movie would be than that. What 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 say you, John? I know you have to have an opinion on this. Oh my! Um, <laughs> worse worse than the Patriot. Uh, there's got to be some. There's got to be know. some that I've seen that, that just I, drive me crazy. I focused on the Patriot so much. Mm -hmm. that <laughs> I always forget there's other bad movies out there. Ooh. Oh yeah, and or or the ones that use so much like CGI and stuff. It's just like, come yeah. on, you know, it's this isn't realistic. Um, that's a great question though because I've been so focused on putting down the Patriot for so many years, uh, but there have been others I'm sure of that that just drove me crazy. Uh, yeah. But some of them are from like some of them that that drove me crazy were from. Uh, you know, like the 60s and 70s, and they became cult classics. Like, you know, the the guy, one of the guys, uh, I remember this one scene in, in Full Metal Jacket that just drove me crazy, that it was like, this uh, this isn't even close to being, you know, looking yeah. realistic or whatever, but it's like, you can't put Full Metal Jacket down. It's a classic. It's Yeah, you know, it's a classic. classic. I mean, one of those could be another M Mel Gibson movie. Um, my and my dad, who's watching this right now, I'm going to get a lecture about this later, and possibly my mother, um, Braveheart. That just came up in the comments. <laughs> Did Braveheart come Jacob, up in the comments? Yes. Jacob, Jacob Cruz <laughs> just came up. Braveheart is pretty atrocious. There you go. Jacob, me and you. Me and you. <laughs> Um, oh, no. Pearl Harbor. Yes. Thank you, Brian Fisher. Pearl, Go ahead. Pearl Go ahead, Harbor dude. was pretty terrible. I think Braveheart for me, what was so bad is the, and I'm not even a material culture historian. Like I'm not that serious about it, but like the kilts and stuff, like this is too early for that kind of stuff. Um, the fact that the battle of Sterling bridge isn't fought on a bridge. I mean, that's <laughs> how like, yeah. What? Oh yeah, yeah. instead of the name. Sterling. Yeah, they took yeah. the bridge out of the name. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's awful. But one that I'm gonna say, it's atrocious to me. Do you do this, John? Where if it's, I actually don't think so because you watch a lot of movies that are based on your favorite time periods, right. and I usually try to stay away. Um, my favorite time period movies and mini series and series and whatnot are usually eras that have absolutely nothing to do with my time period. In fact, I would say Outlander and John Adams are probably the only two that I, I play with just because I know I'm not going to enjoy it because I'm going to pick it apart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I watched one episode of Turn <laughs> and Turn, Turn hurt my feelings and hurt my soul. And because I study Virginia Loyalists and one of the main characters and main regiments that are shown in turn are the queen's rangers yep. and i study the queen's rangers like i mean i feel like i know some people in the queen's rangers better than i know people in my own family mm -hmm. um and john graves simcoe i feel the same way and i watched the first episode and i wasn't happy and then i read some stuff about how they kind of really vilify simcoe and that did not sit well with me. Um, so I could not watch it for my own health, but it doesn't mean that I don't appreciate it. Kind of like with Hamilton, even though I can't stand Alexander Hamilton, I think the musical is one of the greatest things that could have ever come out, you know, during our time period and how it did become an instant cult classic because it brought mm -hmm. so many people to history. Mm -hmm. Um, 
also, you know, the demographic representation of, you know, just, it was phenomenal. Um, just, I try to stay away. Do you watch a lot of films that are from your time period or do you try to stay away? Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to be studying First World War studies in, in Ontario. So, uh, and I've been really hardcore on that for a while. Uh, but I usually wait until uh, they come out like digitally so I can watch it at home. So I'm not sitting there either grinding my teeth or crying <laughs> one or the other. And, uh, but um, I find myself jumping all around different eras. Like, I mean, I have, I have hardly any uh, knowledge of like revolutionary war material culture or anything like yeah. that, but I will watch movies or shows about that era. Uh, same with Vietnam. I think We Were Soldiers is, you know, a pretty good movie. Uh, but I don't have like any background in studying Vietnam uh, mm -hmm. hardcore. Um, and there are a few others. I mean, I know that your husband said you won't watch The Gladiator, but that's one of my favorites of all time. I can't uh, watch Gladiator just because it's sad, not because yeah, it's sad. of anything historical. Oh yeah, there's a, and Ashton will probably write in the thread too. You're, you're typing it out, aren't you, honey? Um, Dunkirk, I wouldn't watch Dunkirk with him. Oh really? No, because I, I am very sensitive. <laughs> That makes, in fact, I say that's one of the reasons why I say the revolution instead of the civil war is because, you know, in the revolution, there's a lot more like, oh, and um, civil war is really, really sad. Um, so I can't, oh God, like I just, I can't, there's a lot of war movies, Saving Private Ryan, I have a really hard time with, oh, yeah. um, Gladiator, oh my God. And even as horrible as Braveheart is, I watched it once, I'll never watch it again because I wept like a baby when they killed Mel Gibson at the end of the movie. <laughs> I, I can't do it to myself. Can't. I, I'm one of the few guys that uh, I can't watch Saving Private Ryan because it's so atrocious. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. I'm sorry, guys, I can't do it. I watched the first 30 minutes, the landing parts, the best part, and after that you lose me. Uh, but I did meet, uh, Sergeant Bob Slaughter, who was with the 29th Infantry Division, he landed at D-Day. He was a Virginian, landed at D-Day. And uh, this guy was, I think he was 6'6 in World War II, huge guy. And uh, I, I met him and one of the first things he told me about was how his backpack was shredded at Omaha Beach because he leaned into the, the gunfire and the, the machine gun fire riddled his backpack. And they invited him to the premiere of Saving Private Ryan. And he's sitting there and everyone else is sitting there. And uh, Spielberg came up to him and said, basically, hey, Bob, uh, what'd you think of the movie? And he's like, well, the beach was a lot longer than what you put on there. But other than that, it was OK. And it's <laughs> like, you know, it was a lot wider than that. But it wasn't 30 yards or whatever. I mean, that's pretty deep, but he was but that's that was his his kind uh a kind of person you know that's that generation where it's like well you got this wrong but yeah it was nice otherwise um <clears throat> my partner kara says one of the worst movies ever made robin hood prince of thieves with kevin costner kara i thought we were friends <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> no are you kidding me as alan rickman as the sheriff it, okay any oh. movie with alan rickman i just it's, mm. that's it Someone yeah. did. Someone yeah. did post after that. Uh, Alan Rickman is the only reason to watch that movie. So there you go. So true. Alan, cut your heart out with a spoon. <laughs> yeah, but there are but <laughs> there are other time periods where uh, we step away from our own as historians. I think it's escapism where we're like, oh, we see we mm -hmm. talk about this all the time, and you almost feel like you're doing a movie review. Like if I went and I saw 1917 in the theater, I'd be like, am I supposed to do a review of this or enjoy it? Yeah. Or just sit here and enjoy the show and just yeah. whatever. Um, I know uh, a couple of years ago we had Boardwalk Empire really took off. And then the, the whole um, bootlegger kind of uh, uh, attire came back. And of course, Peaky Blinders. Mm -hmm. And all that. I mean, I have the haircut from Peaky Blinders just because, I mean, I like the 20s yeah. looking stuff. It's amazing how these little things can influence us. And I know from doing interpretation, you know, it's just like those those movies that people attach themselves to are like, oh, I saw Band of Brothers and I want to have an interpretation of that. Or yeah. some woman has a god awful dress in, in the Civil War and she saw it in Gone with the Wind. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like, oh my, here we go. Oh, gone with the wind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Ooh, That's gone another with... one. But it's it's a classic. Oh, I mean, I hope no one watches Gone with the Wind thinking they're going to get an accurate historical depiction of the Civil War era South. But at the same time, it's you know, it's it's kind of like one of the classics that's just it's there. But for me, I do the same thing. Like in order to enjoy a film or a show, it usually has to be completely out of my time period. Um, or or on the periphery of my time period. So one of the shows that my mom and I like consistently watched together while I was growing up was the Tudors, um, oh, which yeah. is horribly historically inaccurate. I mean, they get some things right, but mostly they're just interested in showing, you know, the really hot Henry VIII and his butt and all that stuff. But um, it, I feel like I could enjoy it. And also it made me a lot more interested in early modern European hmm. English or early modern English history. Mm -hmm. um, so now I know a lot more about that time period just because, and that actually had an influence. That was one of the, I was looking at possibly studying that era in history too, because I love the Tudors so much. Mm. And yes, but John Adams won out. So I have a question from Carolyn Seal. Oh God. Hey, Carolyn, that's my mother. Hey mama. Why does Hollywood change the truth when the real story is just as exciting? Mother, good question. <laughs> Good question. And that's that's kind of what I talked about with the Patriot, right? I don't understand in the Patriot why they felt the need to burn people in a church when there are equally horrifying slash disturbing, you know, um, scenes coming out of the Carolinas. Um, I'm going to horribly recount this story. So someone who studies this, if you're watching, I'm so sorry, but I don't study Carolina during the revolution, even though, you know, I know it well, but not the story well enough to get it 100%. Um, but there's a story between Patriots and Loyalists, I believe it's coming out of North Carolina during the war, where there, of course, you know, there's a group of Patriots and a group of Loyalists, they don't like each other. They actually didn't like each other before the war started, and they kind of use the revolution as an excuse to hate each other even more and actually attack each other. Other. Well, um, a, pa a Patriot officer, or no, a Loyalist officer is killed in um, some battle in the Revolution, and um, in order to get revenge, they attack a Patriot household, kill all of the children, chop off their heads, and line them up on a fireplace. The wife who's living in the house is pregnant they kill her remove her child and they write in her blood thou shalt not bore a patriot on the wall wow. that happened in real life and I'm like that's horrifying you know those are ki the kinds of stories that actually happen in real life and we make up these other things that didn't necessarily happen so I don't know why people make creative choices like that do you have anything to say about that john i'm wondering if part of it is the fact that there's just not enough archival you know like let's go find out what actually happened and let's spend yeah. the money to find stories like that to put into this so we have a a violent scene that's like the one that they use that's not even true yeah. or whatever else i just think it all comes down to are they going to have the mindset to get it right, number one? And number two, do they have the time to research to get it right? Yeah, can, that's true. You can tell when a, a movie is really well researched as far as... Like Master and Commander. Yeah, like like Master and Commander and like a few others that I can think of off the top of my head that, that were like, wow, this is really thought-provoking and impacts and, and this actually would have happened if this wasn't a historical fiction, you know, because Master and Commander is historical fiction but they got the uniforms right and some other things. They actually took the time to study it. And um, I think that you can really tell where they're like, we just want to get out a, uh, a story that has like a love triangle and all this other stuff going on and, you know, burning down churches with people in it because that's a shock and awe thing. And that tells us who the antagonist is. I just think it's a, it's a cop out where it's like the easy route is to always do that. I mean, when you're when you're showing a scene like that in the Patriot, it's no different than when like Heath Ledger's the Joker and blows up the hospital. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 
it's the same thing. It's shock value. It's not historical accuracy as far as the historically based or quote unquote yeah. uh, movie is historically based is what time period it's in. And I do know, um, because a lot of times academic historians are called on and hired to be historical consultants on specific films, miniseries, that kind of stuff. Um, and I have heard from a lot of people who've served as consultants before, how frustrating of an environment sometimes that can be, because like I said before, you know, they're, like you said, they're trying to get this film out, and sometimes, you know, money and time is worth more than historical accuracy at times, so yeah, it's right. an issue, yeah. My, my good friend and newly minted doctor, Jessica Sheets, is on. Jessica! Hey, yeah. Jessica! <laughs> and she says uh she but she says uh but i will say a fiction work got me into history and that's rifles for weighty which is a good Hi. book uh so i got her into some some stuff there uh that. jeremy becknell says uh your thoughts on where does they shall not grow old fall in the spectrum between documentary and pop history film Ooh. I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you jump on this one because I have been negligent in watching. So I can't, I can't comment well. I did go see that one in the theater uh, just because I, it, it wasn't in very long originally. And it was going to be like a one night showing or a two night showing. And I was like, I got to go see this on the big screen. And I know that there are differing thoughts on it because there's an argument among historians about colorizing historical photos some people mm -hmm. love it in the pure form and uh, some and some yeah. people love the colorization of it now my argument is we've been colorizing black and white photos since they were being shot as tin types yeah. so you know that that's my argument to it but i will say that uh i thought they shall not grow old was fantastic in my opinion i thought it was great because it was short sweet to the point enough for popular history to utilize it you know to me yeah. it's a piece of popular history because it's only like 90 minutes it's like a documentary you would see on netflix or whatever mm -hmm. it gets people interested and it's not for someone like me who could sit and watch it for three hours it's for someone yeah. who's like oh this is pretty cool there's you know this but there's some great documentary aspects to it i mean if, if the amount of work that they put into that movie is just astronomical and then to bring together all the first-hand accounts i think is fantastic so i would say things like that uh cross lines as far as that's concerned uh kind of like you know it's pop history to me but it but it's that that movie documentary that um uh, allows people who don't know much about the first world war to be like wow this is pretty cool and you can watch it in 3d and you can do all that I just think it's an amazing film that was done really well. And I know a lot of historians disagree with me and that's fine, but um, I really enjoyed it. And I, I wanted to go back and get a second look at it and I never got the chance, but now you can just buy it on Amazon. So, you know, you can check it out there. I will say about stuff like that. Um, I appreciate those kinds of documentaries and films that come out around anniversaries, even though some of them can be a little, you know, sketchy historically. Um, sometimes I feel like we will forget major anniversaries if Hollywood and, do, you know, documentary companies aren't pushing some of this stuff out. I mean, wasn't that long ago we had a Civil War anniversary, we've had a World War One anniversary, a Rev anniversary is coming up soon, World War Two is of course, I mean not in the grand scheme of things it's not that far away, um, and I really feel like a lot of times we forget these points of history and it's kind of Hollywood is a huge advocate for keeping you know us remembering that you know World War One the anniversary just happened and I feel like I, I was actually kind of disappointed with the reception for world, world war one. Yep. Did you feel like it kind of flew under the radar? I like, thought, yeah, I thought that yeah. we, I so thought we celebrated the first world war in America exactly how we fought in it. Yeah. we we didn't <laughs> yeah. think about it from 2014 to 2017. Then we're like, Oh, we better get on this. And then we just, yeah. we, I, I didn't like the, I didn't like the fact that we had, hardly anything to it. And our biggest campaign was in the first world war and, 
Yeah. yeah. We lost more. We lost more men in the First World War killed than than Canada did, than yeah. New Zealand did, and yet we can't give it more than just like, oh well, whatever. Uh, yeah. But that's and I mean, you kind of saw that felt with 1812, um, because in 2012. Oh, yeah. I mean, 1812 and like is a huge moment in American history and it really in popular history and academic history. I mean, all histories, people for some reason forget the 1812 at the War of 1812 actually happened. Right. Um, and I live not too far from New Orleans where I am. And at the time I was living in Virginia when it was a commemoration of the Battle of New Orleans. And I don't think there was as much surrounding that anniversary as I had anticipated or I had thought. Um, I There was a very good PBS documentary that came out around 1812, but I mean, there were no movies that I know of. Um, so because Hollywood didn't take it upon themselves to embrace the War of 1812, that anniversary kind of just moseyed on by and right. yeah, which poor 1812, that's kind of I feel like that should be my next project just to lend a hand to the memory of the war of 1812. You just want to come to Upper Canada and, and do research. I just want to come to Canada. Honestly. And just come it, up there, do some research. I freaking love Canada. God bless Canada. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what, they they know 1812. Yeah. Uh, they, for good reason. Yeah, okay. Thank you for saying that because if Tad Stormer is watching this right now, he's going to yell at me and be like, um, Canadians, 1812 is a big deal. But yeah. in the United States, it was supposed to be a big deal here. And we just don't remember it the same way Canada does, which mm -hmm. there's a wonderful book by Alan Taylor, if you're interested on 1812, that discusses that. But Oh, is, is that the one where uh, it's uh, seen from a Civil War standpoint? Uh <sighs> There's one that's like an 1812 is like the second civil second or the first American civil war is the 1812, even though I disagree and say it's the revolution. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, he, I know in this book, he basically argues that 1812 is the end of the revolutionary war. Okay. Um, oh, well, not that in a war, the revolutionary movement. Right. So then it'd be the second revolution. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's a very good book, but at the same time, you know, it's like I said before, Hollywood didn't embrace it the same way others did. And therefore it kind of just, went away yeah right. here in the united states not canada hey canada yeah exactly they're still on it for they're reason. still celebrating 1812. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh rain kaiser is on and he says uh i'm ashamed how little history i know compared to my canadian friends let me tell you they know american history really well and it's hard mm -hmm. to even have an american talk about the war of 1812 we fought against fought against them basically and we don't know anything about it other than like some some country song they did about Andrew Jackson in in New Orleans. That's about it. You know? I think that's most people's exposure to the War of eighteen twelve in the United States is that little ditty. That's that about it. Star Spangled Banner, but I guarantee you, a lot of people think the Star Spangled Banner was penned like during the Revolution. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, that's one thing. But that goes back to the point of our conversation tonight. Uh, popular history hasn't done enough in my opinion to sway some of that in that way where we just feed into these unknown mm -hmm. or, or these these mythological perceptions of the past to feed you know this kind yeah. of wave of not really knowing or trying to understand it we just want to be entertained in a way yeah. um I have, a, I have a very negative view of a lot of the popular history stuff as far as what the message is coming across as uh however i think that the message outweighs the authenticity a lot mm -hmm. of times and yeah. so you know we have to look at it that way as historians are we really looking at it for the authenticity factor like you and i might or should we be looking at it from a message standpoint i think a little bit more almost from a message standpoint um, as an academic historian, a lot of what I write isn't necessarily meant for, you know, popular or public consumption. Um, it's adding to an argument in the historiography. And I get sad sometimes when, you know, the American people, I feel like they should 
know a lot more about a historical topic than, you know, they don't. And then I realize a part of that's my fault is because I'm not helping, you know, teach and send the message. So at least with popular history, for me, it can serve as a gateway drug, just the way it served for me and you um, to hopefully inspire and get people to, you know, look into things. And I mean, here's the deal when it, we didn't, one of the things we didn't talk about tonight, we've talked a lot about movies and miniseries, and I know we need to wrap up soon. Um, we didn't talk about books. Um, there are a lot of phenomenal popular history books. And there's also some really, really bad popular history books. And, you know, as an academic historian, I hope one day that it's my mission to try, you know, to write for the populace, because I think we need to have a role in helping to educate the public, not just for entertainment reasons, but, you know, to get the correct message across about what happened in a time period, you know, Civil War was about slavery, <laughs> kind of the thing. Yeah. So, you know, I think it popular history serves as a gateway drug to send a good message. And hopefully people will look into it more, show interest and keep doing their research. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great point to end on because uh, as you say, we didn't get to books yet, but we're gonna have to do a part two, I guess sometime. Uh, I mean, we're not going anywhere for a while. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're interested in a part two, comment and say hell no or hell yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let me know what you think, and we'll take a poll. And uh, we'll go a poll and talk about books. Yeah, we'll do books next time, and and what we're actually watching, that would be good too. Yeah. Uh, but no, I'm I'm really glad you chose this topic, Stephanie, because it's something that uh, impacts all of us because we're stuck inside. We're watching Netflix, we're watching Amazon Prime, or we're watching cable or whatever it may be, uh, or digging out some old DVDs we haven't watched in a while. And uh, the popular history thing is what's gotten both of us into the time periods that we're discussing. And I'm sure a lot of people who are who are watching and commenting and such that got them into even more things or maybe they were like you where they're like oh i want to talk about something in the 1200s but now i want to talk about something in the 1700s mm -hmm. or like me with the american civil war now i want to do first world war because the centenary really turned me around and i started to see a lot of other stuff going on i think your your subject that you want to talk about tonight is so very important for us as historians who are also going you and i going into academia uh and saying what are the students watching and what do we need to be watching or what are they reading and what do we need to be reading? What are they playing on video games? And then you can contact me and find out. But, <laughs> uh, you know, I think it'd be awesome to, to do another one where we just talk about monographs, talk about books and, and the ones that uh, are out there right now and yeah. showcasing how they're popular history. We can talk about John Adams again. <laughs> yeah, it's a book. Except, except <laughs> the book. David McCullough. Oh, I love it. Yeah. And, and, and the fact that people like David McCullough are more popular history authors than mm -hmm. some others, you know, whoever you see on TV, like, you know, plugging a book, uh, as far as that's concerned, you, you know, they're, that's what they're known for, you know, so I think that'd be an interesting topic. I think it would be an interesting topic. And I mean, I think, you know, one of the reasons we even talked about this before we went live, um, books can be a touchy subject because I definitely don't want to go on a um, journalist bashing rant for sure, because they're phenomenal journalists who write phenomenal histories, um, especially in popular histories. And I think that would be something, you know, that would be good to talk about possibly for another podcast or podcast or Facebook Live. Yeah, another I'm Zoom meeting. To my child scream in the next room, and I'm worried about my husband. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, we should let you get to, back to them and make sure they're fine. Terrible twos, man. Woo. God bless you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but Stephanie, thanks so much for spending time with us this evening. It really means a lot to me, and I know we got a lot of comments to go through that we didn't oh, get through tonight. Um, and uh, we'll come back through in the next day or so, and and see what we can do and uh, answer any questions or anything and. But I appreciate you coming on for the fourth time, my dear, and uh, I really appreciate it. You've been a great friend to me, a sister from, you know, another mister. Yes, uh, definitely. And, and, you know, I'll always back you up, boo. <laughs> oh, I know that. I know that. And uh, you're all like family to me, and I really appreciate you coming on and, and doing this with me. And uh, we're going to have to hit up the book thing next. Next. Uh, yes. So, part two. Yes, we'll do a part two. You can come on for a fifth time. Has anyone else been on five times or would that, what no, I No, you're in the lead with four. 
then I need to like really push that lead to make sure. That, <laughs> yeah. You know. yeah. You need to have a cushion. So I do. That, so when someone comes in, you can be like, well, I'm up to seven. <laughs> you know. Exactly. exactly. So. All right, Stephanie, good talking to you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Appreciate Thank you all. You Let us know in the comments if you'd like us to do an R1 later on about books and, and whatever else we didn't touch on, maybe we can do it next time. So take care everyone, have a good night.